Where was God during the tsunami, the hurricanes, the earthquakes? From the CIA.gov website, 8.37 people out of a thousand died on Earth in 2007, the world population being 6.6 .6 billion, means 55 million people died that year meaning 150,000 people die every day, okay? When a tsunami or a hurricane or an earthquake happen, the objection, therefore, is not about people dying, it's about people dying in one place. And would that suit you better if they were dying elsewhere? They're dying now. You are appalled when you know of so many who have died because you were able to grasp because they were in one location. But where is your objection in your heart right now since the beginning of this lecture how many people have died on earth? Another issue is, fine, let's say they didn't die in the tsunami and they were left to live, the tsunami never happened. Who tells you that these people wouldn't have lived to suffer more and that was a blow of mercy to them? I'm not saying that was. I'm saying if you object, there will be many answers. That's not an objection that can be used to object against the mercy of God and more will come. Because one might say, why would they die in another way? in another difficult way. God is more merc is merciful. He could let them die with less pain. We'd answer, when they die in less pain, again, would we want them to die in the same location or not? Is, is that what's going on? Or are we just saying, we don't want death? If that's what you're after, you're saying, I want heaven. And that's another issue. Another question, among the questions is, if there is a God, and you say he's merciful, most merciful, shouldn't he do the best for us in every which way and decision and in every instant in our lives? He's the most merciful. He can do that, can't he? The answer is absolutely not. Let's talk about another subject for a second to understand it. Tell me... Why can't God make a rectangular square? I'll answer this question is, sorry, unintelligent. Because the question contains a fallacy, a contradiction, and tries to project it against God. Okay? So in here, the, per the question or the objection contains the fallacy. That's easy to understand. The other issue is harder to understand, but we'll do it. Why wouldn't God, the most merciful, provide the best for us, for every creature, every instant of his existence? No matter what you're going to give, there's going to be more, right? You want more. You're asking why wouldn't he do the best for us? The best for me would be never to die, never to be controlled by anybody. So you're actually telling me why wouldn't God take himself out and put every creature as a God? Again, because the best, you want the best. You have to stick to what you mentioned. The best is the best. You say just a little bit less, we say that's it. We agree. This is a fallacy, self-contradicting fallacy. What you have asked for has been done. You say, why not 
having created me without me, uh, allowing me to make sins, oh, he did that. He created angels. It has been said, correctly so, that angels are endowed with only reason in the Arabic meaning. Reason is a faculty of restraint based on reason. Angels are made of reasonably reasoning self-restraint, obedient to God. This is the way they were created. They cannot disobey him, even if they wanted to. They have no free choice. Animals are the opposite. They're endowed with only instinct, a drive toward physical needs and pleasure. As for man, he has been endowed with both. We have been endowed with reason. It helps to look at the meaning of the word reasonable, being reasonable about how far to go. Man is endowed with intelligence and self-restraint. He's also endowed with the drive of instinct and seeking pleasure. As such, whoever's reason and self-restraint overcome his pleasures, his drive for pleasures and instincts, this man, according to any of our listeners, is definitely above angels. They haven't got the temptation, they haven't got the struggle, they haven't got the choice to make. And man we take refuge in God from that man whose desire, the drive of the flesh, or pleasure, or self-interest, overcomes his ability to be reasonable, self-restrainable. This man falls below animal because the animal can't help but doing what it does. Why not put me right in heaven? Because of a divine decision to make creatures happier than you're asking. In the hereafter, you'll have angels who have committed no sin, who know the greatness of God, who know many attributes of God, who know the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God. This knowledge that the angels have in the hereafter, some of the attributes, the knowledge of some of the attributes is only theoretical. Yeah, God forgives, but uh, 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 as an angel, you know, yeah, yeah, God is most forgiving. And that there is a great pleasure and bliss for an angel to know that, okay? But, Imagine having made a mistake to a beloved person. Imagine that all indications are that he's got, this person is going to be very hurt and upset. And imagine what would happen if you find nothing but forgiveness and total mercy when you meet this person. If you can see the type of pleasure that you will get from that, this is the type of pleasure to experience that humans will have as an advantage. Experiencing, experiencing, not theoretically knowing, the mercy and the forgiveness and other similar attributes of our Creator. This is the advantage and the edge that our Creator had decided to provide as a chance to creatures like us on earth. Our prophet said, if you did not commit sins, Allah will take you away and bring another people who will sin and he will forgive them. The issue here is his forgiveness will add knowledge, 
which will translate in the spiritual building that you're building for yourself, this knowledge in the hereafter will translate into a bliss not available to, angel, to angels. From this perspective, since the hereafter is eternal with no end, the suffering for me in this life is worth it. Would you invest $10 if you know you're going to get 1000 Yes. Would you invest 1000 if you're going to get a million? Yes. Would you invest a million if you're going to get a billion, 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 billion? Uh, yes, even though the million is high. So for people who have reached the point of certitude in the issues discussed here, even the suffering for me, God forbid, we always need to ask our Creator for the least hardship possible. Never be a macho. That's one of the guidelines in our religion. Yet, after it happens, if it happens, we are taught to remember the result, the afterlife. For us, it's worth it. Here's a hadith about that issue. The Prophet said, the person among the people of hell, meaning bound for hell, who deserve hell, who was most privileged in earthly life. So here we have a person who had everything he wanted in this life, most privileged, but deserved to go to hell. The person among people of hell who was most privileged in earthly life will be taken and dipped once in hell. Then it will be said, O oh, son of Adam, have you seen any good ever? Did you get any happiness ever? He will say, no, by Allah, O oh Lord, i.e., in comparison to the suffering, the 90 or 100 years of life of pleasure is nothing. The Prophet continues, and the person among people of paradise, meaning bound for paradise, who's going to go to paradise, who was most miserable in earthly life, will be taken and dipped in paradise. Then it will be said to him, O son of Adam, have you seen any hardship ever? And he will say, No, by Allah, no misery ever occurred to me, nor have I ever seen any hardship ever. He means this pleasure now, in comparison to the 200 years of misery and leprosy that I have seen, and I accept the trade-off. And that was one dip. The remainder is eternal. So now the point, what about those who didn't succeed, those who are going to go to hell? What does the most merciful do to them? Here we relate a hadith of a mother of a baby who had her baby near a fire in one of the trips where the Prophet was near, the fire grew stronger. She took her baby away from it. Then something happened in her mind concerning the questions in question now. She went to the Prophet, said, are you the Prophet of Allah? He said, yes. I remember the fire grew stronger she took her son away from it, her baby. Then something clicked in her mind. She went to the prophet who was nearby on another campfire probably. Are you the prophet of Allah? He said, yes. She said with love, and that was an expression of love, I ransom you with my father and mother. Isn't Allah the most merciful? So she had a question. She was not coming with a stubborn rejection in her mind. She had a legitimate question. Isn't Allah the most merciful? The Prophet said, indeed. She said, but the mother does not throw her baby into the fire. He leaned down, weeping silently, then lifted his head to her and said, Allah 
does not punish, but the strongly insolent rebel who rebels against Allah, against Allah, sorry, and disdains to say, there is none worthy of worship but Allah. La ilaha illallah. I repeat it. Allah doesn't punish, but the strongly insolent rebel. Meaning, he doesn't punish the ignorant. He doesn't punish the guy who has been misled. He doesn't punish the person who didn't know better. He punishes only the strongly insolent rebel who insists and does not want to accept that there is none worthy of worship but God, Allah, whose name is Arabic. In another uh, hadith, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all my nation enters paradise except those who disdain. They said, and who disdains, O Prophet of Allah? He said, who obeys me enters paradise and who disobeys me has disdained. Narrated by Bukhari as authentic hadith. In another authentic narration, and runs away from Allah like the camel's running away from its owner. Just, just running away. Scholars explain that non-believers essentially disobey him too, disobey the Prophet. Again, if they received the message right and refused their own logic. These are the strongly insolent rebels. So we're not talking about an innocent person here. We're talking about a person, about a person who by his own actions and will has covered against himself. As well as the ayah, we will not punish until we send a messenger. Now, what type of messenger? Do you think that it is fair for our creator to send the messenger to Arabia and punish people in Russia who haven't heard about him at the time? It's not logical, it's not fair, it, don't hap it won't happen. Do you think it's logical, it's fair, for a creator who is more merciful to send a messenger acting like a clown and then punishing those who don't believe in him? That's not fair. Islam requires of every Muslim to arbitrate his reason first. Belief in Islam is never accepted as just following what others said. Each Muslim who believes in his creator must come to it with reason or not against reason. That's not reasonable. It's not Islam. Allah will not punish that guy because he's innocent. He did not commit the crime as described by the Prophet. Allah does not punish but the strongly insolent rebel. That's not a rebel. That's an innocent person. The ayah that we mentioned, we will not punish until we send a messenger. Messenger has to contain all the meanings of the word. A messenger who did convey the message to that person with a non-distorted manner, then that person is liable for punishment.